Hi, everyone, and welcome to Calling All Vegans, where we aim to network, support, and activate the vegan and animal rights communities, discuss the V word in a relaxed but unapologetic way, sample out speciesism, and encourage pre-vegans to open their eyes, minds, and hearts and become vegan. I'm Sue Spar. This is my friend and co-host, Alec Fosse. Although Hi, today everyone. I learned he's, he pronounces it Alec. I had no <laughs> idea all this time, but anyway. Oh. Thank you everyone for tuning in. And um, if you haven't already, we would strongly encourage you to go ahead and subscribe to our new YouTube channel, Calling All Vegans. If you enjoy the, the content that we're providing, please like, comment, and share with your friends. All of these things help us get the word out. Our guest and his wife are people whom I greatly admire, and rightly so. They are humble, modest, convicted instruments of change who exemplify radical kindness and protect the powerless and precious. Formerly a high profile executive who at just 34 years of age was a boy wonder on the fiscal fast track as the VP of a little old corporation you've probably never even heard of called Citibank. He's a now a beloved unapologetic vegan philanthropist who has received many awards for being such a decent human being and gives our movement a ton of credibility in the corporate sector, which is a very tough nut to crack. His speeches have gone viral, reaching tens of millions around the globe. Among many other organizations, he is a significant supporter and activist with Sea Shepherd, meaning he gets to hang with badass Captain Paul Watson, which you'll see that uh, maybe he rubbed off on him a little. <laughs> and is a major supporter and member of the advisory board of the International Anti-Poaching Foundation, which protects rhinos and elephants from poachers using the all-woman, all-vegan Akashinga team of rangers. The founder of Winsome Constance Kindness Trust, he runs it along with his spouse, providing funding to some 500 vital projects benefiting animals, the planet, and people in over 40 countries. Now, for someone who doesn't like being thrust into the spotlight, he sure does get thrust into the spotlight a lot, but prefers to do most acts of kindness away from the public gaze. I envy him and his wife, Trix, the magical opportunity they have to make so much positive change in the world. We're his first Canadian Zoom talk, so we're tickled green. <laughs> okay, well, there's half the show gone with that intro. Please welcome <laughs> Philip Wallen to Calling All Vegans. Yay, thank you very much. Thank you, Sue, and thank you, Alec. Now, you were invited to participate in a two-hour debate at which Peter Singer was sitting alongside you. Wow, that's mind-blowing. Um, afterwards, 73.6% of the audience voted in agreement that meat should be off the menu. Vegans and animal activists the world over are familiar with and applaud the powerful 10-minute speech you gave, Animals Should Be Off the Menu. You certainly didn't do it half measure, gave it the full Monty, so to speak, and a person really would have to be a complete psychopath for it not to resonate with them. Did you expect the overwhelming reaction you got? Sue, I didn't expect the kind of reaction I got. In fact, that was the first debate I'd ever been in. Wow. I was asked if I'd, if I'd like to participate without even thinking. I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> um, I, I had no idea what, that it would resonate with so many people. I understand it's been watched or seen 64 million times now I don't, I'm translated into 20 odd languages so uh, but you know we had to win that debate it was, each side had three speakers uh, but we actually had four uh, we had the truth on our side it was such a blinding glimpse of the obvious and you'd have to be prof extraordinarily cruel profoundly ignorant or deliberately obtuse not to see the point and I'm surprised we only got 72 percent I of course, um, uh, the odds were actually weighted against us because many, a large number of people in the audience came from the, the meat and dairy industry. Oh. And we got them to turn as well. Now, you yeah. do have the noble objective to alleviate suffering by gladly divesting yourself of everything you own and dying broke. I'm of the same mindset, but it wouldn't take me more than a week. But <laughs> how's it coming along for you? Well, so far, we're right on budget. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, as we've clearly stated, you have been living a vegan lifestyle for some time now, and you've dedicated your life to it. Can you give our viewers a little bit of background as what led you towards this decision of embracing veganism? Uh, many years ago, I, as you know, I was a merchant banker, and as part of my job, I went out to see a client, 
Uh, and at the time, you must remember, I'm, I was a, a meat eater. My favorite food was filet mignon and lobster, a fact for which I'm so profoundly ashamed today. Anyways, it turned out that the client had, uh, was a conglomerate and had interests in many different industries. And I went around to have a look at all of them. And one of them turned out to be a slaughterhouse. And what I saw that day absolutely terrified me and affected me profoundly. And I became a vegetarian overnight in a heartbeat, but I didn't know enough to make any intelligent, rational decisions regarding the dairy industry until shortly thereafter, I went on a business trip to India. And I happened to be walking down the street one day and I saw a dairyman dragging his injured cow to the slaughterhouse. Now the cow had been hit by a lorry and had broken her spine. She was in agony. And to get her to move, he was throwing chili powder into her eyes and shoving sharp objects up her anus. And she was being dragged on a rope. And alongside her was her starving, skinny, scrawny calf. Well, he dragged her to the slaughterhouse gates, but before he handed her over to the butcher, the bastard milked her. So even at the last moment of her life, she was being abused at the hands of human beings. Now, if that doesn't change the heart of a man, nothing will. So I came home and I studied the dairy industry and I discovered that milk was actually meat in liquid form. All my ideas about dairy being the bucolic, pleasant, joyful meadows and streams and hills um, of Green, of Shelley and Wordsworth and Keats um, was a preposterous lie. It is a gulag of despair. So I became something of an expert on the disgusting, vile, squalid dairy industry. And I decided never to consume dairy products again. But I actually didn't call myself a vegan. I didn't realize that I had, that's what I'd become. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so today, um, and I, I was spared um, having to be berated by um, oh. the vegan community for not being vegan enough. Um, I didn't have much contact with them. I just discovered that's what I was. So today my shoes, my belt, my watch band, uh, oh, have no animal products in them. Uh, I am uh, proudly vegan, and uh, I'm astonished and surprised that every rational, ethical human being on the planet isn't one already. I went vegetarian when I was 19, but everything else was vegan except for the fact that I ate eggs and cheese. And then, you know, a few years later, eggs went out and then, mm -hmm. but it's that damn dairy, huh? that you just don't realize. But dairy is not a, it's not a food, it's not a fad. It's a goddamn drug. Yep. And, and the meat and dairy industries are, are pushers and they facilitated the wheels of those industries are being greased by vested interests uh, in, oh, in the corporate yeah. sector, in the banking sector and in government. Uh, not because they are inherently evil, but they're, they, they're fundamentally lazy and there are barriers to entry in it, into every industry, but there are also exit barriers. So I think our activism has got to be pitched in a much more intelligent, rational way when we're trying to get these organizations to transition out of these vile industries into ones which are ethical and sustainable. You and your wife, Trix, set up the Winsome Constance Kindness Trust. It's run by you and your wife, and it was named after your mom and your grandmother. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about that? What's the mission? What's the story behind the name? The only reason I came up with a different name was uh, I, I don't, I like to be invisible. I didn't want, see, we're not even a trust. I, I just didn't want anybody to know that I existed. Mm -hmm. So I, I was able to, to, and of course, if you did a corporate affairs office search, you won't find any connection or win some constant kindness. But over time, as the footprint started to increase and, I became slightly uh, dragged um, unwillingly into the public eye. I realized I was just wasting my time. So yeah. people still call it with some constant kindness trust, and it's really not a trust. It's, it's just a way, I, uh, a device I use to preserve some kind of uh, anonymity. And so basically all I do right now, the things I, I try to do is, um, I made a lot of mistakes when I started, 
but we fund things that you probably know about, like schools, clinics, shelters, sanctuaries. And we focus on what I call the five fingers, um, children, animals, the environment, the terminal ill, and aspiring youth. But a disproportionate amount of my time and effort happens to be in, um, in the animal sector, because that is the most, the, the animal industrial complex is the most potent, uh, dangerous negative vector force on the planet today. I'll give you why. In human history, um, only uh, 100 billion human beings have ever lived. Seven and a half billion people are alive today. And we human beings torture and kill two billion sentient, living, loving animals every week. We stab and suffocate one billion ocean animals every eight hours. 10,000 entire species are wiped out every year because of the actions of one species. And we now face the sixth mass extinction in cosmological history. If any other organism had done this, a biologist would call it a virus. Oh, for sure. It is a crime of unimaginable proportions. So I think if, you, if anybody wants to do some good for, for humanity, the first stepping off point really is to get into the animal industrial complex and have a massive reformation of that, it, you can't call it an industry, it's actually a, a grubby trade. I've got to go along with you on that. <laughs> I think I'm pushing an open door here. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, in my estimation, you're getting lots of bang for your buck with the various uh, uh, initiatives that you support. Uh, but how do you measure your rate of return on the funds you invest? You know, I, I basically see myself as a, a venture capitalist. I, I say I'm a venture capitalist for good causes. Uh, but my metrics are not measured by rates of return on, on uh, capital employed or, or, or any of those metrics. Ultimately, it's basically on lives saved. How many lives can I save by this particular project? How many gigatons of, of um, CO2, for example, can we save from getting out in the atmosphere? How much plastic can we get out of the ocean or not let it get there in the first place? Uh, uh, how many fewer cases of cancer, osteoporosis, diabetes um, will we be able to create if we were all able to, tr tr to transition uh, to um, a vegan diet? So those are the kind of metrics, imprecise as they are, that go through my mind. Um, so every project that I, I get involved in, I sure I put up some money to help them, but I also give them some advice, encouragement, some strategic guidance, introduce them to, to the right people. Well, that's invaluable. Uh, it is, yes. Um, because I, I, for better or worse, um, I have spent a lifetime, well, not quite a lifetime, but a long time in the corporate community. Um, I left, I left the, 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 the corporate finance world too soon. I left on my 40th birthday. Wow. Um, I don't have any regrets, but I, I still have a, a a number of relationships and contacts in a number of industries. And I'm able to uh, uh, bring parties together. And you'd be very surprised at how many people from big corporations, CEOs of banks and mining companies and uh, engineering companies and law firms, who've in their own way become animal rights activists and have become donors to causes that are important to them. It's, um, it's, it's quite a remark. And most of the people I talk to outside the animal rights world are people roughly my age, who are basically, if I can put it this way, although it doesn't apply to me entirely, who are asset rich and time poor. <laughs> and I, tell them, uh, I tell them all, look, you, uh, you guys don't like putting money into any project that is dodgy, ones that are not going to meet your objectives. Well, you know that I have actually put my own money into these projects and I give them a list of them. And I've done my own due diligence. I know these people. I've visited the properties. I've put my own money into the construction or into working capital or providing ambulances or a school or something for an oncology ward. So you know that if I've put my money into it, they've got my tick of approval. You've got some street cred, so they're gonna you know, trust what you have to say. And generally speaking, if they, they, they go out and they support these projects directly. And I tell them, I don't really want to know who you support or how much money or what you've done for them. Just do it off your own back and develop relationships with them, 
maybe you can help them in other ways as well. If you, if you don't want to give, or give money to them, go on their boards, give them advice, introduce them to other organizations, just be, become part of their networks. You and your wife, Trix, have uh, helped fund several projects. I'm just wondering if you particular have one project that you are particularly uh, strongly attached to, and does your wife, uh, Trix, have one that she really is passionate about? I don't have any children, but uh, it's like trying to pick which is, which is, which is your favorite child. <laughs> Let, let me give you one example. I, I like projects that deliver on a number of fronts. 20 years ago, I was funding an animal birth control project in India where dogs are taken off the street and um, uh, taken to the shelter in a dog catching van. And they're given anti-rabies shots. They neutered it and spayed and then released back on the same street corner. And as a consequence of this, um, the, the street dog population has come down and the incidences of rabies in this particular area has um, been reduced from a very high number in those days to zero now. Wow. So that has been a very a good result. Wow. Now, for, using that as a, a springboard, we've taken it, the same group that it's called VSPCA, Vishaka SPCA. I'm uh, a disclaimer, I'm uh, uh, the chief patron of the organization, so I know it quite well. Mm -hmm. um, it's on the Bay of Bengal in India, for example. Now, then while Trix and I were traveling in this part of the world, we noticed a lot of poor people living in the streets and begging for food during the day. And they um, would sleep under a tree or under a shop awning. And they invariably had a dog or two uh, beside them for security or comfort or warmth. And they would share whatever meager pickings they got uh, with, the, with the animal. So we came up with a weird idea we signed a contract with a local restaurant who provides a hot meal. It's a, it's a large amount of rice um, on, a, on a large banana leaf with a vegetarian curry poured over the top and a hot spicy soup, plus whatever uh, fruit is in season, apple, pear, banana, or peach, and a bottle sachet of water. And uh, our van goes around to the restaurant, picks it up every day, and um, delivers it to a street corner. Oh, and beautiful. the poor people come out. You, if you go on, on the Facebook or where you'll see me handing out the food to them. And we say to them, look, don't treat this as charity. Treat this like a stipend or a little job. So if you see a dog that's given birth to puppies or someone's whipping a horse or lorries hit a cow, go to any shop and they let you use the phone, call our shelter, and we'll send out an ambulance to pick up the animal. And they said, sure. We started off by having, we, we call them kindness mobile restaurants. Um, we started off with one, we've got five, and long term I'd like to have a hundred and we'll sort of brand them like Starbucks. So when I kick the bucket, um, uh, some other guy in India or a group of people can take them over and run them and fund them. It's, it, it's a very simple template. So from, from the animal birth control, the ABC program, uh, the street dog program, we went into the kindness of our restaurants and then we set up these things called kindness farms. VSPCA um, acquired the land and we put up a fair bit of money to buy 20, 30 odd acres of land on which we had a biogas plant, um, a couple of thousand animals, maybe 40,000 plants, a biogas plant of course and a couple of bore wells and uh, the biogas plant takes the cow dung from the bovines and now we're 100% self-sufficient in cooking gas, about 50% self-sufficient in electricity. The slurry that comes out of the, out of the plant is used as fertilizer to grow fruit, nuts, vegetables, and flowers. And uh, the Indians are very smart. They have a thing called Ayurvedic medicines. They've been using it for 5,000 years. Uh, they use the urine to make Ayurvedic medicines as well. Wow. So, so that's how we, um, we have the kindness farms, the kindness mobile restaurants, and the kindness streets program for the dogs, and VSPCA is the, is the group that, that quarterbacks, if you like, the whole thing. And then we have Kindness um, um, Oceans project, still on the Bay of Bengal, where we've constructed a number of turtle hatcheries for the Olive Ridley turtles. Now those animals live to 90 years, and they're being absolutely decimated. Mm -hmm. So we've been funding those projects over many years, and I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of Olive Ridley turtles have been saved in the process. 
and now we're moving into kinder skies and hopefully we'll be able to do the same thing uh, for um, the birds that come all the way from Siberia. Um, the paint, uh, a number of species of birds and that part of, um, of Andhra Pradesh and Orissa is rich in bird life. So we're hoping that we'll be able to preserve those birds if, if possible. Of the various kindness projects that you have, one of them being Kindness House, we understand that you have- I uh, see a theme developing. Exactly. I think there's a pattern developing here. Um, I understand that there's some special clauses in your lease for Kindness House. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The kindness House was an experiment about 25 years ago. It's a, it's a wonderful building. Um, it's 800 meters away from Parliament House in the financial district, slap bang in the middle of um, uh, a very exciting pro-vegan, vegetarian, artistic, bohemian area. Um, it's 40,000 square feet, and we, we own the building. It, it's, it's one, it, it was a very interesting idea at the time, but it was entirely an experiment. We put about 300 odd very smart young people in the building from organizations like Sea Shepherd, Greenpeace, uh, Lawyers for Animals, the Wilderness Society, United Nations, um, uh, social firms, the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence. And nobody that anyone's ever heard of, right? <laughs> no, no. no. Uh, well, many of the organizations uh, came, to, came to us when they were working off kitchen table and um, they really had nothing. Um, and we've, we've helped them grow. We've given them money, encouragement. And the building had um, 45 serviced offices and we provided all the facilities they needed like boardrooms, training rooms, kitchens, showers, air conditioning, heating, a movie theater. We paid all their bills, rates, taxes, insurance, cleaning, security guards, electricity. We paid all their bills. They just had to pay um, their own outgoings. 85% of them paid nothing at all. Um, the, the others paid what they thought was fair, what they could afford. Now they have all grown massively. So, so Kindness House is basically an incubator, if you like. Yeah. Um, someone worked out, and I've, I've never really checked the numbers, that, but in the time that we had it, um, these little organizations raised $100 million for themselves, wow. which they wouldn't have been able to do. Mm -hmm. And they become very, very, and there was no micromanaging them. They, we just provided the facilities and let them do their own thing. But the two uh, important clauses in the so-called contract uh, one, if you ate animals in my building, I'd kick you out. And two, if you had a dog and you, did, you didn't bring him to the office, I'd kick you out. I'd <laughs> <laughs> kill So it was a, but, but I wanted to put another clause in there. You know, when you've got 300 young, attractive, hardworking, oh, yeah. driven people, yeah. uh, people from different organizations start to develop friendships and relationships and start to get married. Yeah. Now, I believe in a thing called zero population growth for human beings. Yeah. And that was an abject failure. You know, we had actually had uh, three lots of twins and one lot of triplets born to people <laughs> in Kindness House. Nice going. So I, I asked the lawyers if I could have a clause in there saying that there's going to be no hanky-panky between yeah. the tenants. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and the, the lawyer said, no, Phil, you can't do that. No, no. Oh, that's wild. And we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. 